Wisteria Island across from Key West, folks were eking out a living right next to the opulence of Sunset Island. We found a bit of room amongst the typical Florida vessels to anchor for the night. We left Marathon, which is where we originally checked into the U.S. when we first came here, and we thought we could go back to that same office to check out to go and see if they'll give us a zarpe for Mexico. We thought, okay, we'll give them a call. They said they're going to be open until 8 p.m., and we thought, okay, that's a good idea. We'll arrive in a couple of hours at Key West for 8 p.m., and it'll be our final stop before we leave the U.S. on the boat. We called them again when we arrived in Key West. They said, is your office still open? And they said, yes, yes, but get here before 7 p.m. So we rushed over. It was about 6 p.m. And they didn't help us at the office. They just didn't have time to do anything for us. Now, apparently, the office is closed for the entire weekend. And our weather window is this weekend. (laughs) We need to be across and at least halfway across the Gulf Stream before this weekend is over. So we're leaving and we're probably going to have trouble when we arrive in Mexico because in Mexico they're going to ask us for a zarpe. But apparently there's just extra paperwork to be done if we don't have our zarpe. We're going to go with that route rather than to miss our one and only clear window, weather window for crossing the Gulf. We want to go when it's fairly calm. We had a rough trip coming up. We're doing our best to get on through in the calmest possible forecast as there's a lot of uh, swirly, whirly, swirly (laughs) phenomena in the Atlantic right now trying to form. A hurricane's trying to form here and there and we're trying to make sure we miss all of that that we don't get caught up in any of that shit. Key West was no place to dive and to clean our bottom one last time before heading to Isla Mujeres, so we started towards Dry Tortugas, looking for clear water. Squalls were following us everywhere. And then I'll go tie it off. We randomly dove into the water near Boca Grande, but the water and the weather were unsettled. We did manage to clean our bottom before getting chased out of there by a really nasty looking cloud. We made a run for the opposite side of the key to take shelter from the waves. This was a chance to try out our new to us foul weather gear. Mine is brand new. Yours is a little And as soon as we set the hook, some confident seaplanes started buzzing us as they flew in and out of the surrounding squalls. Why? Why? Yeah, you told them. You told them, Joko. Early next morning, we were out. We crossed from the inside of the Hawk Channel out to the open ocean without a fuss. Back into that color of water. We're starting the day by fishing amongst some squalls, dead ahead, 80 something miles. We have Marina Hemingway in Cuba. The plan was to cut straight across the main arc of current. Yeah, on that row. Did we have it for a long time? I think we have. Oh no, I think we just got it. I mean, I just put the line in less than five minutes ago. Are they good to eat here? Yeah. <laughs> Delicious to eat. And 
then it was time for us to turn on the wind vane. Hey, you want to let go? See what it's doing. She's still struggling to stay downwind, like she really wants to go upwind. Unless we pull the sails in, and that makes her want to go a little upwind. 20 miles about south of the Keys. This was the spot. This is where we saw a lot of freighter ships last time, keeping an eye open very carefully, pointing uh, towards the back of them so that we can clear safely across their route. I think he was going to make it in front of us, but it does. It's a lot faster than we are. Of course. We tried to keep up smiling and a good mood, but in reality, we were both feeling pretty disappointed that the wind vane was not going to keep a course at all. The course is slightly awkward to pass in behind in this guy. We got the jib luffing a little bit. You're heading more downwind than our sails are set up for right now. Sort of sitting there being like, this man is like, are you really playing chicken with us? We're not even gonna scrape his paint if he, if he runs us over. It's like, I don't think they would even hear it or feel it. On I the guess boat. not. Apparently not. Like, oh, who's that? Did painting the face on the wind vane make it upset and that doesn't work properly? No. Old and stiff and... It was working on the way here. We've been troubleshooting the wind vane most of the day so far. It's weird because while we were in the US, Robbie kept it greased up, we made sure all the moving parts kept on moving. Nothing seems to have crudded up or crusted up to, to stop moving. The wind vane is working as it should, but as soon as we put the chain on to the tiller, attach it to the tiller, it stops functioning as it should. It doesn't correct when we're going upwind and, and it has a really hard time correcting when you're going downwind. Yeah, that's too bad because that's three days of hand steering if we don't get it working. Puffy clouds is okay? Yeah, it's better than the big, big clouds, spotty yeah. clouds. Oh, you don't like your life jacket, Jogo? Hmm? Speed 
was him almost. Yeah. We started traveling real slow, despite feeling like we were moving real fast. We were, of course, crashing face first, meeting the Gulf Stream current. All right, this evening, our troubles started when our speed suddenly dropped down from three knots, five, well, we started the day five knots, four knots, three knots, two, and one, and then under one knot. So we decided to turn on the engine. We were fighting the heart of the Gulf Stream current. It was expected, but as soon as Robbie turned on the engine, I noticed something weird. There was a lot of smoke, more smoke than usual. Our stern running light at the back, you could really see the smoke billowing up. He went and he checked if water is circulating within the engine, and it is, but it was also coming out the heat exchanger, the little, uh, uh, there's a little external pipe, I guess extra, when extra steam or pressure needs to be let off, it comes out there, and that pipe was filling our little, uh, jury-rigged bottle setup that we had that we had before it told us that the engine was overheating in previous episodes about engine troubles and that was very unusual we haven't had that happen at all to that extent water coming into that uh, container and basically salt water spewing out our heat exchanger. Kind of strange. We didn't really know what it was. Kept on running the engine. Now the smoke started billowing even more out the back of the exhaust and Robbie was like, nope. <laughs> I don't think this is happening. And I said, yes, check in, in the oil. Check the dipstick. And of course, the dipstick comes out with a mayonnaise oil consistency. So we have salt water getting into the engine, which is the whole reason why we have the heat exchanger is so that salt water does not enter into the internal piping of the engine, but it is. And we think that the problem might be, well, first of all, we had to figure out right away how we're going to keep on running the engine. We've got zero knots of wind, very little wind and we've got like two or three knots of current against us. We're just going to be carried up the Gulf Stream if we don't keep the engine running. Robbie decided that number one, we're going to keep the pressure down. So he opened up the heat exchanger and now water is just kind of spewing out of the heat exchanger freely. We've got the bilge pump going half hour every hour but that seems to be bringing the pressure down in the engine overall and we're seeing a bit less smoke come out the exhaust so we're still motoring trying to get to harbor where we can do the fix we've talked about it for a little while in the cockpit we think that the leak might be just might be in the fresh water circulating pump. One of the seals is leaky and we've been meaning to change that seal. We bought a couple on Amazon. We don't know if they fit so he's been hesitant about opening up that whole area letting all the water out of the engine and now we're forced to do it and I think we're also going to be forced to bypass the heat exchange. We're going to just run salt water through the engine now and hopefully some solutions come from this but yeah pretty stressed out about making it to land and not just being carried away by the Gulf Stream current we've got two days of extremely light winds we were expecting that we were going to sail this one day try and get some spinnaker in on the second day and then on the third day we'd, we'd definitely have to motor the last third of the, the journey and 
Yeah, we're not prepared to motor another 24 hours. The engine might gum up from that mayonnaise and that will be the end of our engine. Although, <laughs> might be the end of it now. One thing at a time, we're gonna try and get to land. The engine was losing power now as we sputtered and puttered towards Marina Hemingway, the closest destination that we could aim for. In hindsight, of course, we would have loved to have anchored anywhere else along the Cuban coastline, but alas, they called us over the radio as soon as we were within their visual range. Attention, attention, sailing vessel moving approach in Marina Hemingway. This is Marina Hemingway calling you over. Marina Hemingway, this is uh, in Esperada. Okay, in Esperada, uh, please, uh, I have a solution for you. You have to navigate our sea marker, painted white and red, leaving it to your starboard side. From the sea marker, advise you make a course 140. 140 of the breeze go between the red and the green markers. Robbie requested safe harbor for 24 hours to resolve our engine situation. They're gonna make us do the new the check-in process was a whirlwind of paperwork <laughs> haven't filled out that much paperwork in a little while they took all our money <laughs> but we have a day of rest and working on the engine now welcome to cuba we have to fix the engine or else we're gonna miss our weather window and this was the reason for making a stop as opposed to trying to do the work while underway exhausted and being pushed backwards first we started by removing the fresh water pump so the impeller managed to push water through our engine fresh water despite being falling apart what happened here is we removed uh, the heat exchanger is kaput and uh, I think it caused pressure to raise water pressure to raise inside the engine causing water to get in the oil well the water leak we hope came from the where the old water pump was installed now we're just gonna close that up with an aluminum plate no more double water pump system and then we fabricated an aluminum plate to seal off where the pump used to be. Just to cover the, where the old pump goes. And then we hope for the best as we tested out our new saltwater cooled engine setup. As soon as the engine starts, I want you to put it on minimum, like okay. lower. Or lower it, okay. Very luckily, our friendly neighbor at the dock lent us his brand new oil change pump so that we could remove and check the oil very carefully for water. And then, for a very short couple of hours, we enjoyed our stay at the lovely marina, where lack of resources was made up by the plenty of natural beauty. Of course, we really wanted to stay here and to make the best of our check-in. However, the marina was going to cost us another 30 bucks per night, which we had some difficulty already figuring out how we could pay for it. And then there were hurricanes threatening to form all around us. 24 hours later, and we were on our way out again.
The good part about checking in to Cuba would be that we would now have no problem anchoring from here to Isla Mujeres if we needed to. As we left Hemingway Marina, I hoped that we would be able to make a proper, actual visit to Havana again sometime soon. Got ourselves all checked out from Cuba. So within 24 hours, we checked in and checked out of Cuba. The most expensive 24 hours that we've ever spent at a marina. Uh, about three, almost 300 bucks for one night of repairing our engine. I would, I would say Cuba's not doing its, itself a favor being so expensive for the check-in. We couldn't stay here long, we couldn't do any activities. That was it, that's a full month's worth of groceries gone just to check into the country. We couldn't afford any tours or any fun things, both because of the weather and because just literally the check-in's quite expensive in our opinion. It's kind of fun, you have a party of all the officers coming on the boat, looking around, looking at all our equipment, and they all really love the dog. Everybody loves to see Choco. As we suspected, sticking closer to the coastline allowed us to bypass some of that strong Gulfstream current. Motor sailing. This is why we had to make sure the engine was working properly. We're going about four knots against, or kind of semi in the current. Both sails up. Yeah, we have to have the engine on or else we would not be making much progress. This is a hard place to go forward without lots of wind or without the motor. I'm so happy you installed this rail around the stove, Robbie. Now we can actually cook things this trip without it flying off the stove. Yeah, what what stoves, what marine stoves usually have also is the little arms and we were thinking of in these making grooves and you can stick the arms to hold the pots even better in place. But for now, this makes a hell of a difference. I'm gonna fry up a little bit of fish in a moment, just with some hand-bent aluminum. We could see a fellow sailor struggling to make headway as they were probably experiencing about two or three knots of current instead of the one knot that we had against us. Let's see if we get one of the critters that's swimming around the boat. Maybe half an hour, 45 minutes, put it up and give it a charge. Another hot, slow, and sticky day went by along the coastline of Cuba.
until we were finally released from the current and we quickly approached Punta San Antonio. We received a detailed weather update from Robbie's mum via our mini satellite tracker, and we would need to cross the Gulf Stream ASAP unless we wanted to wait at anchor here for about another week. Uh, mini cargo ships and the Filipino guys have been going there at each other. Not going at each other, have been talking to each other for like the last half an hour. Thinking of asking them for diesel, but uh, I should have. These, these are the type of people that would stop for you and give you diesel. 20 bucks for diesel. For it's like being back in Asia. <laughs> The next 24 hours would be great weather for crossing, but then after that, things would deteriorate quickly. We used up a lot more fuel motoring against the Gulf Stream than we expected. Several night passages, hand steering is wearing. <laughs> and we're both really tired, but this might be our weather window to do the crossing over to Isla Mujeres. There was a nice little bird. Did he scare the bird? Choco, don't scare the bird. We might not have the bird anymore. There's better routes from Key West to Isla Mujeres. We didn't take the best one for going from point A to point B easily or, or quickly because we cross the Gulf Stream, or interact with it, I should say, three times. A lot of motoring last night to just get through that, even though we were very close to shore in the nighttime, very close to the reef in the nighttime, we still were uh, experiencing more than a knot of current in our face, for sure. We had a sailboat next to us to use as reference they were further out. They were definitely experiencing more like two knots of current in their face. Our stop in Havana, or rather at Marina Hemingway, lots of fun. It better have been fun, but I think in the end was necessary. We ended up putting the engine into usable condition. I would say fix. <laughs> the engine is never fixed, but it is in usable form at the moment. We wanted speed to jump across the busy shipping lane marked on the chart. We want to be flying up slightly into, into the, like a broad reach. Let's try to get across this shipping lane as quickly as possible. An oncoming cruise ship responded to our call on the VHF radio and graciously helped us to keep our pinched course to pass in behind him. A cargo vessel then passed quickly ahead of us on the opposite side. And then we were free of the shipping lane, or so we thought. Our difficulty with ocean traffic was not even close to being over. We started to cut across the strong Gulf Stream current for the third time now on this trip, and the spinnaker began to falter. There was more water turbulence than there was wind. We were dodging cargo ships left and right. Altering our course left and right was slowing us down substantially. I don't know what is going on that's different. There's like 
a freighter ship. There's tankers all around us. There's literally 10 tankers around us that we can just see. Of course, we, we tried to get a used AIS unit somewhere in the US. We didn't manage to afford and to find that deal. And like, I'm sure on AIS we would see 20 boats around us. There'd be more than what we can visually see. We questioned whether or not we would make it across to Isla Mujeres before the oncoming storm.